For almost 90 years, Henry VIII ruled England with a tight fist. After he perished, the country was on the edge of a cliff. What would become of Prince Edward, his heir, then nine years old, and who would rule the nation until he came of age? The following years were not easy for the Tudor family. Henry VIII had left behind a will in which he explicitly established what would have to be done after his death. A Regency Council would take care of all state affairs until Edward came of age. The Regency Council would be comprised of 16 men. All would have the same level of power, as the objective would be to ultimately protect the system's balance. But only hours after his death, a group of ambitious courtesans took the reins of power. The dominant figure was Edward Seymour, brother of Jane Seymour, third wife of Henry VIII. As Edward's uncle and England's most important military commander, Seymour considered himself to be the natural fit for the role of Prince's guardian, and he wasted no time. Seymour picked Prince Edward, who by that time was living on the outskirts of London, and took him to the palace of Enfield, north of London, where the young prince met his sister Elizabeth, then thirteen. When the two children were together, Seymour informed them of their father's death, kneeling before the new king. The children's weeping was so sad that the servants started crying as well. Seymour prepared the king for his arrival in London. On January 31st, 1547, Henry VIII's death was announced to Parliament, three days after the occurrence, and Edward was proclaimed heir to the throne. The new king was acclaimed with a deafening cannon salute as he entered the Tower of London where his royal advisers were waiting for him. On the same day, Edward signed Seymour's appointment as England's protective lord and king's tutor. Edward was crowned king of England and Ireland at Westminster Abbey on February the 20th. He became Edward VI. During his short life, he was a solemn, reserved, and commendable king the true image of a monarch. He was considered a young King Solomon, having emerged to rule England wisely. Henry VIII became a celebrity as soon as he was born, on October 12, 1537. After 28 years of waiting for a royal heir, the birth of Prince Edward was punctuated by exuberant celebrations, only tainted by the news of the tragic death of Queen Jane 12 days later. At a time when everyone dreaded sudden death, Edward's health and safety were maniacally taken care of. The floors of his quarters were washed three times a day, and his food only had the best ingredients. He spent his early years around ladies who taught him elegant ways and the basics of reading. At six, Edward entered the world of men, with his education reaching a different level. According to every report, Edward was a great student. At seven, he was already an expert in Latin, knowing how to conjugate verbs and write verses. Studying and reading were his natural hobbies, but he also liked games and races with his friends. Unlike his sister, Elizabeth, he did not inherit his father's passion for hunting or music, and he was not fond of hunting. At eight, Edward sent a letter to his stepmother, Catherine Parr, asking her to remind his sister Mary, then 29, that she was ruining her reputation with her passion for foreign dances and other amusements that aren't fit for a Christian princess. Edward was particularly passionate about religion. From an early age, he loved reading the Bible and developed a taste for long and complex sermons, noting the preacher's arguments minutely. When his coronation took place, he already possessed the traits of a fanatical Protestant and, at twelve, wrote a treatise attacking the Pope and calling him the Antichrist. What Edward lacked was motherly love. His father was a distant and frightening figure, and the first two stepmothers, Anne of Cleves and Catherine Howard, paid little attention to him. Only Catherine Parr offered motherly affection to the boy. When she married Henry VIII, the kid was only five, but was treated so well that he called Catherine my dearest mother. His relationship with his sisters was good, Mary was a Catholic and 21 years older than him, but they exchanged letters nonetheless. And Elizabeth, only four years older than him, 
Edward encountered a close companion. Both were smart from an early age and had lost their mother prematurely. Letters exchanged between the two revealed that they hated being apart. The kingdom of Edward had begun. Edward Seymour, as Lord Protector, was a righteous man, willing to improve the conditions of the poor. However, his unmovable belief that he was always right brought him many enemies. He barely consulted the royal council or the parliament. Henry VIII left the crown in need of resources, and the kingdom was now divided in religious matters. The threat of foreign Catholic kingdoms hovered over, and there was also the Scottish hostility, which started in 1540 when Henry VIII launched a campaign to marry Edward to the Scottish Queen Mary Stuart. From 1547 onwards, Seymour led a campaign that managed some victories against the Scottish, but the French joined the latter, and the tide turned. With no other alternatives, Seymour withdrew from Scotland. In 1549, a rebellion emerged in Norwich with 15,000 men. Seymour had no soldiers to abate the uprising. He asked for help from John Dudley, who had 14,000 soldiers. Dudley's efficiency in halting the rebellion marked the beginning of his inescapable rise to power. Many court members were eager to contest Edward Seymour's right to decide about the young king's upbringing. The most dangerous was his younger brother Thomas Seymour. He even tried to bribe the king with gifts to gain his trust. But the king stood by his eldest uncle. But Thomas Seymour was powerfully ambitious. In 1547, he married Henry VIII's widow, Catherine Parr, increasing his wealth and reputation. He also used his charming ways to entice Princess Elizabeth, then 13, until Catherine sent her away to protect her reputation. After Catherine died in 1548, Thomas again turned his attention to Elizabeth. In January 1549, Thomas attempted to kidnap Edward VI. He entered Hampton Court with a group of armed men, but was stopped in his tracks by the king's watchdog. Facing the animal, Thomas drew his gun and killed it, terrorizing Edward VI and alerting the guard. The incident was reported to the royal council, and Thomas was imprisoned in the tower. He was beheaded for treason. In 1549, John Dudley staged a coup to take Edward Seymour out of power. Afraid of the consequences, Seymour in the castle of Windsor with the king, but ended up being arrested and taken to the tower. He was released, but lost control over the king, who passed to John Dudley. In 1552, Dudley would again arm Seymour. This time, he was arrested and beheaded. On October 1549, Dudley received the title of Lord President of the Royal Council. By this time, Edward VI, now 12, was already deeply interested in the kingdom's affairs, and Dudley knew exactly how to influence him. Dudley's period in power was marked by decisive actions in several areas. In foreign policy, he took a pragmatic approach. Acknowledging that England could not afford to be at war, he put an end to all hostilities with Scotland and France. Dudley also adjusted the finances and reformed the tax system, while making a deeper religious reform. At the end of Edward's reign, the Anglican Church was clearly Protestant. In the spring of 1552, Edward VI was 14 and desperate to have more power. He persuaded his advisors that he could take the throne at the age of 16 instead of 18. He wanted to establish charities for the poor. In February, he created two foundations, a hospital for the sick in St. Thomas's Priory and a school for the children of the poor. Then, in early April, Edward VI suffered a measles attack, which could have been combined with smallpox. At first, he appeared to be completely recovered, taking part in Erzaz ceremonies, but he soon became exhausted. On his 15th birthday in October, he kept coughing up blood. At Christmas, he dealt with his violent episodes of fever. Dudley was desperately worried about his future. He knew that Edward VI's death would bring Catholic Mary to the throne, a danger for the Protestants. In February, the rumors of the king's illness spread. In April, his body was covered with painful ulcers. His legs were so swollen that he was forced to lie on his back. 
a royal doctor predicted that the king would be dead by June, but Dudley continued to issue reassuring bulletins. While the king was still alive, Dudley placed Lady Jane Grey as Edward's successor, protecting himself with power. Lady Jane Grey was Henry VII's great-granddaughter and Edward's second cousin, the fourth in line behind Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth. Dudley's move was aimed at sidelining Mary and Elizabeth. To complete this, Dudley would need time. Unconcerned about Edward VI's well-being, Dudley dismissed his doctors and hired a swindler who applied a mixture of arsenic that would keep the patient alive long enough for Dudley to complete his plots. While Edward was swallowing the dreadful medicine, Dudley amassed royal approval for his plans. Then, Dudley tricked the dying young king, saying that both his sisters were bastards, that they would marry foreign Catholic princes, and that it would be the end of the Protestant religion in England. Edward VI was convinced. Using his remaining strength, the king ordered Dudley to elaborate a will called My Legacy of Succession, which he trembly copied. The final document invested the crown in Lady Jane and her male heirs, and, after these, in Jane's sisters and their heirs. Edward's own sisters were described as illegitimate and not legally conceived. After that, Edward convinced the council to approve his will. By the end of June, Edward VI was agonizing under the effect of arsenic. His body swelled up like a balloon, his skin began to turn black, and his fingers gained greened. Dudley called the real doctors once more. In front of the dying patient, they came up with several potions. On July the 6th, 1553, Edward VI whispered his final prayer, placing his soul in God's care and asking him to defend his kingdom from the papacy and uphold his true religion. The short but eventful reign of Edward VI came to an end.